Welcome to Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan. My name is Joshua and this is episode 94, Magpies, Buddhism, and the Bekje Summer Reading Program. This is one of a multi-part series discussing the late 6th and early 7th centuries during the reign of Kashikiya Hime, aka Suiko Tenno. Last episode, episode 93, I did a very quick overview of just what is going on and some of the players involved. This episode, I want to start deep diving into some of the topics, and we're going to start with looking at the relationship between Yamato and the continent, primarily, but not exclusively, through their relationships, the gifts and tribute that was going back and forth, and immigration, primarily from Bekje and Shilla, and the importation of new ideas, not just Buddhism. This in turn would eventually lead to a formal change in the way that the Yamato state governed itself and how it came to see itself, even as an equal to that of the Sui court, which had unified the various kingdoms of the Yangtze and Yellow River basins in the area of modern China. Now, to begin, we'll go back a bit, because this dynamic isn't simply about Kashikiya Hime, Sogano Umako, or any one single figure, though that is often how it is portrayed. To start with, let's cover some background and what we know about the archipelago and the continent. As we went over many, many episodes back, the early Yayoi period, prior to the Kofun period, saw a growth in material cultural items that were from or quite similar to those on the Korean peninsula. There had been some similarities previously during the Jomon period, but over the course of what now looks to be 1200 to 1300 years, the evidence of people going regularly back and forth across the straits is much greater than we previously thought. It's quite likely that there were Wa cultural entities on both sides in the early centuries BCE, and there are numerous groups mentioned on the Korean peninsula, presumably from different ethno-linguistic backgrounds, though typically only three areas get much focus. Those are the Samhan, or Three Han, of Mahan, Byonhan, and Jinhan. Later this would shift to Three Kingdoms, Bekje, Shilla, and Goguryeo, and they would get almost all of the press. Still, we know that there were groups like the Gaia or Gara Confederacy, and likely other small, eventually isolated groups that did not really have their own stories written down anywhere other than the mentions in, say, the Chronicles of Japan or one of the other three major kingdoms of the peninsula. These groups continued to trade with the continent, and as the archipelago entered the period of mounded tombs, they were doing so as part of a larger mounded tomb cultural area that included both the archipelago and the Korean peninsula. First, you have the Funkyubo, which is to say burial mounds with multiple burials in a single mound, and then Kofun, the singular tomb mounds for an individual and possibly their direct relatives. This tradition reached its apex with the distinct Zempo Koen, or round keyhole style kofun, an innovation that was rooted in continental practice, but at the same time distinctly a part of the archipelago. Many artifacts came over throughout this period, and a fair number of them came with a new innovation, writing. There's debate over the earliest forms of writing to be found in the islands, with evidence of characters on pottery being questioned as to their authenticity. However, it is hard to question the writing that appeared in the early bronze mirrors and other such artifacts that showed up. Early writing on the archipelago, however, is more decorative or even performative, crude attempts to copy existing characters that often demonstrate a lack of understanding, at least by the artisans that were making the various elite goods. Though based on the fact that even the obvious forgeries with nonsense characters made their way into tombs as grave goods, you can probably assume that most of the elites were also not too concerned with the writing exactly either, other than for its decorative, possibly even talismanic qualities. In the 4th and 5th centuries, this began to change. We have specialists and teachers coming over to the archipelago, often there as tutors for the royal Bekja princes who were apparently staying in Yamato as part of a diplomatic mission, and also to make sure, well, there was always someone off-island just in case, you know, the worst happened. No doubt some Yamato elites began to learn to read and write, but even at this point it seems to have been more of a novelty, and for several centuries reading and writing 
would probably remain largely the purview of educated immigrant communities who came to Yamato and set up shop. Though, along with things like the horse, writing may have nonetheless assisted Yamato in extending its authority, as speech could now, with a good scribe, be committed to paper or some other medium and then conveyed great distances, without worry about something being forgotten or lost in translation. So at this point, writing appears to be mostly utilitarian in purpose. It fills a need. That said, we do have discussions of the classics. And as reading and writing grew, exposure to writings on philosophy, religion, and other topics expanded. After all, reading meant that you no longer were reliant on simply whom you could bring over from the continent. Instead, you could import someone's thoughts, or even the thoughts of people who were long dead, and you could read them for yourself. In the early 6th century, we see Bekja sending over libraries worth of books. These are largely focused on Buddhist scripture, but they also include other works of philosophy as well. Buddhism exhorts believers to share the Buddha's teachings with all sentient beings. Even during the Buddha's lifetime, his disciples would go out and teach and then gather back with their teacher during the rainy season. Buddhist teachings, coming over in books, the sutras, came alongside of other writings, other teachings. There were writings about philosophy, about medicine, and about science, including those things that we might today consider magical or supernatural. Those who knew how to read and write, well, they had access to new knowledge, to new ideas, and to new ways of thinking. We can see how all of this mixed in the ways that things are described in the Chronicles. For example, we see that many of the rulers up to this point have been described in continental terms as wise and sage kings. Now, as Buddhism starts to gain a foothold, we see Buddhist terminology entering into the mix. In some ways, it is a mishmash of all the different texts that were coming over, and it seems that things were coming more and more to a head. In addition, there were things going on over on the continent as well, and this would also come to affect the archipelago. For one thing, this was a period of unification and consolidation of the various state polities. Bekta and Shilla had been consolidating the smaller city-states under their administration for some time, and in 589 the Sui dynasty finally achieved what so many had tried since the time of the Jin. They consolidated control over both the Yangtze and Yellow River basins, they set up their capital, and in so doing, they had control of the largest empire up to that point in the history of East Asia. The Sui dynasty covered not only these river basins, but they also had significant control over the western regions, out along the famous Silk Road. With so many trade routes passing through their territory, the Sui could really make some claim to being Zhangguo, the Middle Kingdom. They also controlled the lands that were the source of so much of the literary tradition, whether that was the homelands of sages like Confucius, or else the gateway to India and the home of Buddhism. It's perfectly understandable that those states in the Sui's orbit would enter a period of even further sinification. For the archipelago, this was likely through a lens tinted by their intermediaries on the Korean peninsula, but even there they were clearly looking to the Sui and adopting some of the tools of statecraft that had developed over in the lands of the Middle Kingdom. During the early years of the Sui, Yamato had been involved in their own struggles, and at the end of the previous reign Yamato had an army in Skushi poised to head over and chastise Shilla for all that they'd done to Nimna. But then Hasebe was assassinated, and it's unclear what actually happened to that expedition. Yamato started gathering an army in 591, and Kishi no Kana and Kishi no Itahiko, possibly Naniwa no Kishi in this case, were sent to Shilla and Nimna respectively as envoys, and then we're told that in 595 the generals and their men arrived from Tsukushi. Does that mean that they went over to the peninsula, fought, and then came back from Tsukushi? All a little murky to me and not entirely clear. However, two years after that, in 597, the king of Bekje sent Prince Acha to Yamato with so-called tribute, the diplomatic gifts that we've discussed before reaffirming Bekje and Yamato's alliance. Later that same year, Iwagane no Kishi was sent to Shilla, so presumably Yamato and Shilla relations had also improved. 
Iwagane no Kishi returned back some five months later in 598, and he offered a gift from the Shilla court of two magpies to Kashiki Ahime. We're told that they were kept in the wood of Naniwa, where they built a nest in a tree and had their young. Aston notes here that magpies are plentiful on the continent, but not exactly in Japan, and indeed their natural range is noted across eastern China and up through the Amur River region, as well as a subspecies up in Kamchatka, and yet it seems like they didn't exactly stray far from the coast. In modern Japan, the magpie is considered to be an invasive species, and the current populations likely were brought there through trade in the late 16th century, suggesting that this initial couple of birds and their offspring, well, they probably didn't exactly work out. Even today, magpies are mostly established in Kyushu, with occasional sightings further north, though they have been seen as far north as Hokkaido. Perhaps, though, Naniwa just wasn't quite as hospitable for them, at least not at this point in history. There's also the possibility that the term magpie was referencing some other similar bird. That's always possible and hard to say for certain. After all, if they didn't have magpies in Yamato, then how did they know there were magpies? That said, it's part of a trend as four months later, in the autumn of 598, a Shilla envoy brought another bird. This time we're told it's a peacock. Not to be outdone, apparently a year later, in the autumn of 599, Beck just sent a veritable menagerie. A camel, two sheep, and a white pheasant. Presumably these were sent alive, although whether or not there was anyone in Japan who knew how to take care of them is unclear. I can only imagine what it must have been like to have such animals on board the ship during the treacherous crossing of the Korea Strait. For all we know, there were other exotic gifts that were likewise sent, and these are the only ones that made it. And if all this sounds far-fetched, we do have plenty of evidence of the exotic animal trade along the Silk Road. Animals such as ostriches and possibly even a giraffe or two were somehow moved all the way from Africa along the Silk Road to the court in Chang'an. There were also tribute gifts sent from parts of the archipelago, though I suspect this was quite different from the diplomatic tribute shared between states. For example, there was a white deer sent to Kashiki Ahime from the land of Koshi in the winter of 598. It was no camel or magpie, but white or albino animals, assuming that wasn't their natural color, were considered an auspicious symbol. Also in 595, there was a huge log that washed ashore in Awaji. A local family hauled it up and went to use it as firewood when they noticed that it gave off a particularly sweet smell. Immediately, they put out the fire as they suddenly realized what they had. It was a log of aloes wood. Now, aloes wood is well known as one of the most highly prized aromatic woods, and it famously does not grow in Japan. In fact, it's a tropical wood growing in Southeast Asia. And that sweet smell comes not just from the wood naturally, but from its reaction to a particular fungal infection. And so for a log to have washed ashore all the way up in Awaji, in the Inland Sea, the Seto Inland Sea in Japan. It's almost unbelievable. And perhaps it was part of a trade shipment that sank and then washed ashore. I mean, it isn't impossible that a log somehow fell naturally into the ocean and followed the currents all the way up to Japan, which would have been quite the journey. And so, with such a rare gift, the people offered it up to Kashiki Ahime. This was probably the best course of action for them. I mean, they could use it for themselves, but that likely wouldn't have done much other than help perfume the air for a time. Or they could have tried to sell it, but given the rarity, I'm sure there would have been some questions as to where it had come from. In both cases, I highly suspect they would have been at risk of some elite getting wind and deciding that they should just take it for themselves. By offering it to the court publicly, I suspect they received credit for it at least, and it probably put them in favor with the court, at least for a little while. Now, logs like this would be treated with immense respect. Small pieces would be taken, often ground down and used sparingly. A piece much like this, called Ranjatai, came over as a gift from the Tang Dynasty in the 8th century, and was later preserved at Todaiji, and is still there as part of the Shosoin collection. The story of this particular one is interesting in that knowledge of aloes wood, and the tradition of scent appreciation, 
Well, it likely came over from the continent, probably from the Sui and Tang dynasties, as part of the overall cultural package that the archipelago was in the midst of absorbing. Kind of makes you wonder how the people on Awaji were so quick to recognize it. Despite the apparently good relations indicated by gifts like magpies or peacocks, it's clear that there were still some contentions with some of the players internationally, particularly with Shilla, especially given that nobody had forgotten their takeover of Nimna. It also didn't help that in 600 we're told that Shilla and Nimna went to war with each other. Again. It isn't clear just how involved Yamato was in this, if at all. By all accounts, Nimna was already under Shilla control. Was this a local rebellion, an attempt by Yamato and Bekje to split it off, or something else entirely? Or is it just a fabrication to justify the next bit where we're told that Kashiki Ahime sent an army of 10,000 soldiers under the command of Sakaibe no Omi as Tai Shogun and Hozumi no Omi as his assistant, the Fukushogun? Well, they crossed the waters over to Shilla and laid siege to five of Shilla's fortresses, forcing Shilla to raise the white flag. The Nihon Shoki claims that Shilla then ceded six fortified places, Tatara, Sonara, Pulchiki, Wita, South Kara, and Ara. And since Shilla submitted, the Yamato troops stopped their assault, and Kashiki Ahime sent Naniwa no Kishi no Miwa to Shilla and Naniwa no Kishi no Itaiko to Nimna to help broker some sort of peace. Interestingly, this seems quite similar to the account of 591 when they sent Kishi no Itahiko with no mention of Naniwa. Presumably, it's the same individual, and I have to wonder if it possibly isn't just the same event, just relocated and duplicated for some reason. It's hard to tell. A peace was supposedly brokered and Yamato troops departed, but it seems that Shilla was dealing in something other than good faith. No sooner had the Yamato troops gotten back in their boats, then Scylla once again invaded Nimna. I'd like to stress that there's no evidence of this at all that I could find in the Samguk Sagi, and it's quite possible that some of this is in the wrong section, possibly to simply prop up this period in general. However, it's equally as likely that the Samguk Sagi simply didn't record a loss to Yamato, especially one that they quickly overturned, setting things back to the status quo. As such, the best we can say is that Scylla and Yamato around this time were less than buddy-buddy. With Shilla going back on their word, Yamato reached out to Goguryeo and Bekje in 601. Otomo no Muraji no Kurafu went to Goguryeo, and Sakamoto no Omi no Nukade traveled to Bekje. Shilla was not just waiting around, however. We're told that Shilla sent a spy to Yamato, but they were arrested and found out in Tsushima. They took him and sent him as tribute to the Yamato court. We're told that the spy's name was Kamata and he was banished to Kamitsukeno, aka the land of Kenu near to the capital, later known as Kozuke. There are a few things about the story I think we should probably pull on. First off, that name, Kamata, that feels very much like a Wa name, more than one from the peninsula. And we aren't told their ethnicity, only whom they were working for, so it may have been someone from Wa, or possibly that's just the name by which they were known to the archipelago. There likely were Wa who were living on the peninsula, just like there were people from Bekje, Shilla, and Goguryeo living in the archipelago, so that's not entirely out of the question. Furthermore, it would make sense if you wanted to send someone to spy on Yamato, use someone who looked and sounded the part. The punishment is also interesting. They didn't put him to death. Neither did they imprison him. In fact, I'm not sure there would have been anywhere to imprison him, as there really wasn't a concept of a prison where you just lock people up and leave them there. There may have been some form of incarceration to hold people until they could be found guilty and punished, but incarceration as a punishment just doesn't really come up. Instead, if you wanted to remove someone, banishment seems to have been the case, sending them off somewhere far away, presumably under the care of some local official who would make sure that they didn't run off. Islands like Sato Island were extremely useful for such purposes, but there are plenty of examples where other locations were used as well. They probably could have levied a fine as well, but that seems almost pointless as he would have been free to continue to spy on Yamato. So instead, they sent him about as far away from Shilla and Shilla support as they could send him. This also speaks to the range of Yamato's potential authority. It would seem that Tsushima was at least nominally reporting to Yamato, though 
given that he was sent as tribute to the court, that may indicate they still had some level of autonomy, I would guess. And there must have been someone out in Kamitsukeno in order to banish someone all the way out there as well, someone to keep an eye on him, make sure he didn't just go running back. Of course, given all this, it's hardly surprising that Yamato was back to discussing the possibility of making war with Shilla again. And so in the second month of 602, Prince Kume was appointed for the invasion of Shilla, and he was granted the various bay of the service of the Kami, possibly meaning groups like the Imbe and the Nakatomi, along with the Kuni no Miyatsuko, the Tomo no Miyatsuko, and an army of 25,000 men. They were ready to go pretty quickly. Only two months later, they were in Tsukushi, in the district of Shima, gathering ships to ferry the army over to Peninsula. But this almost seems like a yearly occurrence. Gather everyone up, send them to Tsukushi, get ready to invade, maybe. Unfortunately, two months later, things fell apart. On the one hand, Otomo no Muraji no Kurafu and Sakamoto no Omi no Nukade returned back from Bekje, where they likely had been working with Yamato's allies. Kurafu had been on a mission to Goguryeo and Nukade had been to Bekje the previous year. However, at the same time, Prince Kume fell ill, and he was unable to carry out the invasion, we are told. In fact, the invasion was stalled at least through the next year, when, in about the second month of 603, almost a year after Prince Kume had been sent out, a mounted courier brought news to Kashikiya Hime that he had succumbed to his illness. She immediately consulted with her uncle, Sogono Umako, and the crown prince, Sumayado, and asked them for their counsel. Ultimately, she had Kume's body taken to Saba and Suo, out at the western end of the Seto Island seaside of western Honshu, modern Yamaguchi prefecture, where the prince was temporarily interred with Hashino Muraji no Ite, possibly a local official, overseeing the ceremony. Later, Ite's descendants in the region were called the Saba no Muraji. Later, Kume would be exhumed and finally buried atop Mount Hanifu in Kawachi. A quick note here about time. It's sometimes difficult to figure out just what happened when, even when they have a date. This is all noted, for instance, for the fourth day of the second month of 603. And clearly, it didn't all happen in one day. So, what actually happened on that day? Remember, Kume fell ill in the sixth month of 602, and we're now in the second month of the following year. So did he fall ill and then was wasting away for eight months before he passed away? Or is this the date when the court learned of his death? Or is it the date when his body was finally buried? There's a lot going on. The chroniclers don't exactly provide a blow-by-blow, day-to-day uh, take. My general feeling is that this is probably when the news arrived at the court, which is when there would have been a court record, while the rest was likely commentary added for context, even if it happened much later. In addition, this whole thing holds some questions for me, not the least the name of this prince, Kume. Now, presumably, Kume was full brother to none other than the crown prince, Prince Umayado. He was also a son of Princess Anahobe and the sovereign Tachibana no Toyoi, and we have seen the name Kume before as a name in the royal family, or at least a sobriquet. However, it also means army, which seems surprisingly on the nose given that all we're really told about him is that he was supposed to lead the army. It makes me wonder if this wasn't one of those half-remembered stories that the chroniclers included without all the information. Just Prince Army leading the army. Then again, maybe Kume really was his name, and this is all just a really big coincidence. I also would note that it was not typical, not what we've seen so far, to have a royal prince leading an expedition like this. I mean, typically the Tai Shogun would be someone from an influential family, but not necessarily a member of the royal family. That this army was being led by a royal prince, a brother to the crown prince, also seems to speak to how this was seen as significant. Perhaps that's why, when Kume passed away, they chose as his replacement his older brother, Tahima. Tahima was selected to take over for his younger brother on the first day of the fourth month of 603, and three months later, on the third day of the seventh month, he was leaving out of Naniwa. He didn't get very far, however. Tahima embarked on this adventure along with his own wife, Princess Toneri. We've seen this in past episodes, where women were in the camp alongside their husbands, directly supporting the campaigns. Unfortunately, in this case, 
Princess Toneri died shortly into their journey around Akashi. This is recorded as only about three days after they departed, which likely means it happened quickly. They buried her at Higasa Hill, but Taima, likely grieving his loss, returned and never carried out the invasion. Five years later, things may have improved with Shilla, as there were a number of immigrants, were told that they were many persons, who came to settle in Japan from Shilla. What isn't noted is whether or not this was of their own volition. What forces drove them across from the peninsula? Did they realize that there were opportunities to come and provide the Yamato elite with their continental knowledge and skills? Were they prisoners of war? And if so, where was the war? Or were they fleeing conflict on the peninsula, perhaps political refugees? None of this is really clear. Now, while things were rocky with Shilla, relations seem to have been much better with Bekje and Goguryeo. While exotic animals may have been the gift of choice in the early part of the period, by 602, Bekje and Goguryeo were both sending gifts of a different sort. These were more focused on spiritual and intellectual pursuits. And so, in 602, a Bekje priest named Kwaluk, or Kanroku in Japanese, arrived bringing books on a number of different subjects, which three or four members of the court were assigned to study. We don't know exactly what the contents of each book were, but based on what we generally know about later theories, we can probably make some educated guesses that much of this was based on the concepts of yin and yang energies. Yin and yang were considered primal energies, and at some point I really do need to do a full episode just on this, but during the Han Dynasty, many different cosmological theories came together and were often explained in terms of yin and yang. So elemental theory is explained as each element has some different portion of yin and yang energy, and similarly different directions, different times of day, different times of the year, were all explained as different proportions of yin and yang energies and their interactions, which then contributed to whether certain actions would be easier or more difficult, or even outright dangerous. The book on calendar making, or Koyomi, was assigned to Ochin, whose name suggests he may have been from a family from the continent. And he was the ancestor of the Yako no Fumibito. Calendar making was considered one of the more important roles in continental sciences, although never really seemed to take off to quite the same degree in Yamato. Still, it described how to line up the lunar days with various celestial phenomena, and it was also important for understanding auspicious and inauspicious days, directions, and more. Arts like divination, geomancy, and straight-up magic would often provide instructions that required an understanding of the proper flow of yin and yang energies as represented by the elements and expressed on the calendar in terms of the elemental branch and stem system, with each day being related to a given element in an either greater or lesser capacity, usually related as the elder or younger brother. Events might be scheduled to take place, for instance, on the first rat day of the first month, and so the calendar maker would be the one to help determine when that day would be. Also, since the solar and lunar calendars were not in sync, there would occasionally be a need for a leap month, often known as an extra calendrical month, which would typically just repeat the previous month. This would happen literally once in a blue moon, an English expression referring to a solar month with two full moons. In fact, we just had one of those last month in August of 2023. This isn't to say that the archipelago didn't have a system of keeping track of seasons, etc. Clearly, they were successfully planting and harvesting rice, so they had some knowledge of roughly what time it was in the year. Though there are some thoughts that a year was originally based on a single growing period, leading to possibly two or three years each solar year. Either way, farmers and others no doubt knew at least local conditions and what to look for regarding when to plant and when to perform local ceremonies. However, this new knowledge was clearly a quote-unquote scientific approach, based on complex and authoritative-sounding descriptions of yin and yang energies and their baffling interactions. Closely related to calendar-making studies, another book that the Bekje Prince Kualuk brought was one on astronomy, or Tenmon, a study of the heavens, which was studied by Otomo no Suguri no Koso. For perhaps obvious reasons, astronomy and calendar making were closely aligned, since the changes in the stars over the course of the year would often have impacts on the calendar. 
However, this was also likely very closely aligned with something akin to astrology as well, following the celestial paths of various entities, many of those being things like planets. If you're not aware, planets, though they often appear in the sky as stars, have apparently erratic movements across the heavens. The stars generally remain fixed, at least from our perspective, and they appear to move together throughout the year. Planets, however, take funky loop-de-loop -loop paths through our sky as they, like Earth, are also orbiting the Sun. Furthermore, different planets orbit at different speeds. All of this leads to some apparently strange movements, especially if you envision the sky as just a round dome over a flat Earth. There are also other phenomena, from regular meteor showers to comets and even eclipses, all of which were thought to have their own reasons and, you know, their own import. Some of these were considered natural, neither auspicious nor particularly inauspicious, while others were thought to impact the flow of yin-yang energy on the Earth and thus potentially affecting our day-to-day -day lives. Okoso was apparently trying to get the special bonus for the summer reading program because he also studied another book that came over from Bekje on a subject that Aston translates as invisibility or tonko. This is a little less obvious an explanation, at least from the translation. I don't think that they were literally studying ninja style how not to be seen. In discussions of kami, we've talked in the past about visible kami and thus conversely invisible kami. It appears to be based on a type of divination to help better understand auspicious and inauspicious signs, and is based on a blend of various theories, again connected to a larger yin-yang theory. Finally, there was another volume that was studied by Yamashiro no Omi no Hinamitsu that Aston translates as straight-up magic or hojutsu. Of course, in the worldview at the time, magic was just another science that we didn't understand. By understanding the flow of yin and yang, one can affect various things from helping cure disease and heal the sick to causing calamity, even to the point of possibly learning the secrets of immortality. Much of this would fall into the terms of onmyodo, the way of yin and yang, and there'd been some work on that introduced earlier. That it was being introduced by a Buddhist priest demonstrates what I was saying earlier about just how interconnected all this knowledge was. Other Buddhist gifts were much more straightforward. In 605, for instance, the king Goguryeo sent 300 ryo of what they call yellow metal, possibly an admixture of gold and copper, for a Buddhist image. Five years later, they would send two priests. One of them, Tamchi, is said to have known the five classics, that is, the Confucian classics, as well as how to prepare different colored paints, paper, and ink. All of this is interesting, but it is the usual suspects. Yamato had been siphoning off culture and philosophy from the states and kingdoms of the Korean peninsula for some time, and in that time they began to adopt various continental practices. In later centuries, much of this would be attributed to the work of people like Shoto Kutaishi, aka Prince Umayado, especially the transmission of Buddhist thought, although for the most part we haven't really seen a lot in the chronicles themselves, but we'll get to that. Now, later stories paint Shoto Kutaishi as one of the main forces pushing for reform in the court, especially when they would eventually push for a new 17-article constitution, based on principles pulled from a variety of sources, both Buddhist and Han philosophical foundations. Along with that constitution, the court also instituted a 12-rank system for court ministers. This ranking system would remain in place, eventually replacing entirely the Kabane system that ranked individuals based on their family in favor of ranking one for their individual achievements instead. Furthermore, it wasn't just a status symbol. Rank would come into play in just about all aspects of later courtly life, from the parts of the palace you were allowed in, the kinds of jobs you could do, even the amount you were paid for your service or the amount of land you could have in the capital for your house, making the families of the land part of and dependent on the bureaucracy. And with such a system in place, there was only one natural thing for it. The Yamato court would reach out beyond the Korean peninsula and go directly to the source. They would send envoys to the court of the Sui Emperor himself and establish relations with the Middle Kingdom directly, leading to one of the most famous diplomatic incidents in all of early Japanese history. But that is where I'm going to have to leave it for now, because once we get into that rabbit hole, we're going to have a whole nother episode. 
And so now we're fully grounded in our foundation. We can see Yamato importing people and also ideas from the continent through the peninsula, and those ideas are taking root. They're causing changes, at least at the Yamato court, but those changes would eventually make their way through society and forever change Japan and even how they see themselves. The lens of what is commonly seen as Buddhist and Confucian thought would be a powerful tool that would shape the ideas to come. And that is what we'll discuss in the future. Until then, thank you for listening, and thank you for all of your support. Remember, if you like what we're doing, please tell your friends and feel free to rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. If you feel the need to do more and want to help us keep this thing going, we have information about how you can donate on Patreon or through our coffee site, ko-fi.com slash sengokudaimyo, or find the links over at our main website, sengokudaimyo.com slash podcast, where we'll have some more discussion on topics from this episode. Also, feel free to tweet at us at at Sengoku Podcast or reach out to our Sengoku Daimyo Facebook page. You can also email us at the Sengoku Daimyo at gmail.com. And that's all for now. Thank you again, and I'll see you next episode on Sengoku Daimyo's Chronicles of Japan.